Are you hungry? Are you hungry for the Word of God? It looks like a sea of faces. I know it's not a really large crowd, but it's, as I look across this, this audience, I, I see that there's an attentiveness in your hearts, in your lives, in your eyes. And there's a hunger here. Some of you have acknowledged it when I asked the question, are you hungry? Some of you acknowledged it with yes. But I know there's a hunger in every one of you. And the Word of God says that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. That is a promise that we have. If we are hungry and thirsty for the things of God, we shall be satisfied. And everyone in this room has sometime been hungry in the, in the tummy. You've been working hard or you've been out about and you've been, maybe you skipped a meal or whatever and you feel this gnawing hunger. And then you come in and mom has this wonderful meal prepared and you sit down and you, and you eat. And for about 10 minutes you're just eating. You're, maybe you're visiting, but your main thing that you're concentrating on is you're eating. And after a while you're satisfied. Oh, that the Word of God would be the same way. That we go through our daily lives and we have these periods of hunger where we are more hungry for the Word of God than other times. That's reality. There are times in our lives where we need the Word of God more than when we just went to church. And maybe you read the Bible last night and maybe you read it again this morning. But that was a couple hours ago. Maybe three, four hours ago. Depends what time you started. And many times when we eat, four hours later, we're hungry again. And so I pray that right now you're hungry again. And you're hungry for the Word of God because it is going to come forth here today. I have a short little slot to fill right here, right now. But I believe there's a lot coming later. And so let's look forward to seeing that promise fulfilled in our lives that in about two hours we're going to be satisfied spiritually. The Word of God is going to be pouring into our ears, into our brains, sinking down into our hearts and souls, and we are going to be satisfied in just a little bit here. Filled with the Word, the goodness, and the power of God in our lives. And we all know that the Word of God comes forth, always comes forth in word form. Always. When you read it out of here, it's words. When someone speaks it into your life, it's words. It always comes forth in word form. Now I understand why the Lord laid this short opening on my mind and on my heart. Because what I was feeling this morning is different than what I was feeling last evening. And here's what the Lord wants me to talk about this morning is destiny by the tongue. Destiny by the tongue. Destiny means where you're going. And so where you are going is determined by your tongue, by the words that you speak. And so the meaning of destiny is a predetermined course of events often held to be by an irresistible power or agency. Let me read that a little slower. The meaning of destiny is a predetermined course of events often held to be or caused to happen by an irresistible power or agency. So destiny by our tongue. So we can rephrase this just a little bit. Our tongue or our words predetermine a course of events that is often caused to happen or caused to be held by an irresistible force. Can we wrap our minds around that? It took me a little while to wrap my minds around that. Our words create an irresistible force power or agency that determines where we go. Are we helpless? I mean, we're being pushed around by a force that we can't help? No, we're not. 
We're being pushed around by a force of our words. What we speak is what pushes us in what direction we're going to go. Us and our children's lives are shaped by the words that we speak. Did you hear that? Us and our children's lives are shaped by the words that we speak. And I'm, I, I mean a lot of times, not every single time, but a lot of times when I talk about the power of words, my mind goes way back to when I was a young married man and I was working side by side with my brothers. We were working on the roof and something gave about, we started talking as we were working about positive attitude. And we had a fairly big roof and we wanted it to be done by 5 o'clock that night. And my brother said, if we say that we're going to be done by 5 o'clock, then we're going to be done by 5 o'clock. And so he looked at his watch and he estimated the amount of squares we still had to do. And he said, if we go at this speed, we'll make it by 5 o'clock. And so he said, we're going to be done by 5 o'clock. And the force of those words in that situation caused us to go at a certain speed, having a goal in mind, and we were done by 4.30. That, that timing of what, when we got finished was determined by some words. A little bit of, that one took a little bit of figuring, but yeah, we can do this. There's, there's common sense that enters in that too, of course. You can't say you're going to do... 200 squares in two hours just because you say so. There's still a force of reality in that. But I often think of that. That, that, that many things in our lives happen by what we, because of what we speak. Is that backed up by the Word of God? Yes, it is. Turn to Proverbs 18, verse 20 to 21. Proverbs 18, verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. You see what language they use here? Belly, fruit, Food, hunger. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat thereof. Okay, let's pick that apart a little bit. A man's belly, a person's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth? How can you fill your belly? with words that are going this way. It says right here that our belly is going to be filled with the fruit of our mouth. So our mouth produces a fruit. How can words going out fill this? Usually you, to fill this, you put things this way. How? Here's how. So the word increase there in verse 20 a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips. This word increase, if you trace it back to the Strong's Concordance in the original Hebrew, is talking about produce. Literal produce like the produce of a field. It's that, for, it's that meaning. And so our, our belly or our soul is going to be filled with the produce of our mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So you might by now be thinking, what are dead words? What are words of death? Here it's talking about death and life in this verse. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So it, it, you could rephrase that and say, death and life are in the power of the words that you say. So, what are dead words? And what are living words? Living words are not just the word of God. This, of course, is the living word. But this is, these are not the only living words that we hear. We hear lots of living words or dead words. Dead words, for instance, um, a person who grows up being told that they'll never amount to much or they're never good enough or that you always mess things up, or the list of that kind of words goes on and on. Those are words of death. They do not, they do not produce a lot of life in a person's soul. They, they crush. They crush potential. They crush destiny. 
They crush the ability of a child because they're not true. And they crush. And it hinders a person dramatically. The more words of death that they hear, the, the deader his life is. Now, the, uh, most times a person like that will switch into a, a, a mode of performance, trying to perform to, to prove that they're going to amount to something, to prove that they're going to be good enough. And, and yet, as long as they're told that that wasn't good enough, that wasn't done right, you could have done better, why'd you mess it up? Just on and on, it just crushes that potential in their lives. And, and it can be done in so subtle ways. Fathers and mothers, this can be done in your children's lives so subtle and so unintentionally. And I'm, I'm going to tell a story here. Um, a true life happening of someone that we know. So this daughter and her mom decided to really bless the father, the dad in the home there on his birthday with a pizza supper because pizza was one of his favorites. So she went all out. This was the daughter's idea and she got her mom to help with it. So she went all out and I think they bought pizza. I'm not sure though, but I, I think they bought pizza. A lot, a good pizza. But in addition to the pizza, they had candles and beautiful silverware. Just decked the place out for his birthday. And he came in from work and he got himself cleaned up and he came into the kitchen to sit down and he saw the surprise. And I guess they sang happy birthday as he walked in and then they sat down at the table and they had silent grace. And everyone, especially the daughter... was sitting there with expectation. What is dad going to say? The first words out of his mouth whenever he finished praying is, where'd you get all the money to pay for this? Pow! Crushed. Her motive crushed her vision, crushed the evening. It, everyone sat there and ate their pizza, almost shoving it down intentionally. Nobody was hungry anymore. Where'd you get all the money to pay for this? Crushed by a couple words. Had he said, had he just, after he prayed, had he just looked up and just looked at the table and said, wow. For me? Can you imagine what the difference in the atmosphere? And because we're created in the image and likeness of God, God spoke the world into existence with words. And because we're created in His image and His likeness, we can do things in a similar way, meaning in a likeness, in a like kind way. He created everything we see by words, and we create the atmosphere around us in our homes by words. We're not going to create trees and rocks and mountains by words. But we are going to create mountains of difficulties or mountains of joy in our homes and in our lives by our words that we speak. Because we're created in His likeness, in His image. Then there's the reality of our bodies and how they operate and how they work. And we have this powerful little gland in our, in our body called the hypothalamus gland. Where it literally controls everything in your emotional, biological function. The hypothalamus gland. Tied together with a few other glands. And what happens with the hypothalamus gland is that gland is the one that determines what kind of chemical gets released into your body, determining how you will then feel. It's almost like if you want to feel heat and you want to be warm, you apply heat, right? If you're sweating hot and you're, you're just really, really warm and you want to cool off, you get in some cool water. You apply cool water. Well, this gland determines how you're going to feel based on what it hears. And so when, when your brain, your ears, hear words of death, then relates it, your ears relate it to your brain, your brain relates it to the hypothalamus gland, your hypothalamus gland evaluates what kind of words they are and then decides what kind of chemical to release into your body, which determines how you feel. And so...
this daughter that was all excited while she was preparing this meal. She was thinking good thoughts. Her and mom were exchanging good conversations and they were excited about what they were doing. And so they were speaking words of life and words of encouragement to each other and excitement, anticipation. The hypothalamus gland was releasing oxytocin into their body. Oxytocin makes you feel good. For real. It's a, it's a natural chemical. And that was flowing all the time until dad spoke those crushing words. And then it released another type of chemical that does not feel good. And so people who constantly hear negative words and they are, 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 are crushed in their, in their lives by words, they usually develop a chemical imbalance. And as they grow up, this chemical imbalance has to be dealt with. Many of them will go to a psychiatrist and he says, oh, well, your, your, your hypothalamus gland is, is delivering too much of this chemical that doesn't make you feel good. They won't explain it that way, but that's what's happening. Is This, this hypothalamus gland is de- delivering too much of this type of chemical into your body. We need to give you more of this. And so they give you a synthetic drug to balance that thing out so you have a properly balanced chemical release in your body. And that only works for a little while. Because the chemical is saying, oh, you feel good. It's great. But your situation is saying, I feel terrible. I just got hit again with a bunch of negative words. And so your, 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 your gland is doing this and your, your body is responding to it. Causes oppression, causes depression, causes bipolar, causes all sorts of um, uh, emotional disorders is what it causes. And so the, the right way to get that balance properly is to, is to either be removed from the negative situation or learn how to deal with it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Come to a place where negative words no longer affect you because of who you are in Christ and you apply the, the blood of Jesus Christ to that situation. Yes, it's still hard, but you can, you can actually function. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the blood of Jesus Christ, without forgiveness being released toward the people who are hurting you, you cannot function. You will have a chemical imbalance going on in your system. Fear, for instance. For a person that's living in fear, the, when a person is experiencing fear, the hypothalamus gland releases uh, uh, adrenal, or uh, I'm not exactly sure what you call it, but it's the same thing that gives you adrenaline. That's what you call it. It's, there's an adrenal chemical being released. And the way that works, if a child is growing up in a situation where they're afraid of dad or there's a lot of fear going on because of whatever, they're constantly living in fear, that hypothalamus gland is continuously releasing bits of adrenal. And you need that. When you're taking a walk in the woods and a grizzly bear raises up in front of you, you need a heavy dose of adrenal at that point. That, that being released into your body forces you into action, and usually the action, what, would you, what action would you take if a grizzly bear rose up in front of you? What action would you take? This little boy right here. What would you do? Run! Exactly! That's exactly what is supposed to happen. That adrenal is released to create that adrenaline that rushes through your body so that you re- respond super fast and super aggressively. And after you ran a half a mile, if you could run that far without stopping, and you got into the cabin and you slammed the door shut and you looked out the window and there was no bear anywhere, wow, I made it. Whew, that was close. Your body starts to relax. Your brain says, hey, you're in a safe place now. And that adrenal stops flowing. And you don't have that, ah, I gotta go, anymore. But a child who lives in constant fear of what dad or mom are saying is constantly fear, experiencing that, oh, ah, I gotta run. Constantly. And they can't cope that way. A chemical imbalance is created by that. Now, life by words of life, also against Again, the fruit of your mouth, the, the produce, what comes out of your mouth. Words that speak life are, are phrases like, well, like I shared there about the pizza supper. If he had just said, wow, all this for me? 
that would have released oxytocin in that girl and her mom. Would have released oxytocin from the brain, releases it through the gland, and the body would have just rejoiced. They would have rejoiced in their faces. Their body would have been free, not tense. They would have, the conversation would have started flowing. Words like, or phrases like, wow, great job. You work really hard on that project. Or things like, man, I really like having you with me. This is great having you here with me today. I like when you work with me. Or you cheer up this place. You're such a cheery person. Those release, those kinds of words, those types of words, release oxytocin into your body. There's other ways that oxytocin is released. Another way that oxytocin is released is nursing mothers. As you're holding that baby and the baby is nursing and you're talking to the baby, you're just holding it or you're rubbing their arm or their hand or maybe you take their hand into your hand like this. Oxytocin is flowing in both mother and baby and oxytocin causes two people to bond together. And so when you're working with your children and you give them words of life, words of encouragement, even without touching each other, oxytocin is being released. If you hug your child, many more greater levels of oxytocin are released. And the child feels really good. How many of you little children like to be hugged by mama or daddy? Of course you like hugs. They're designed to make you feel good. Proverbs 16.24. It's one of the next verse I want to look at. Pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to your bones. Did you hear that? This is talking about your body. And so words that you speak that are pleasant, that are kind, that are good, words that release oxytocin into your, through your glands into your body, bring health to your bones or to your body, it could also say. It's oxytocin. And so words that you hear while you're growing up create destiny. Words that we speak to our children as they grow up literally determine where they end up in many cases. For, for, insta, for, for an example here, a story I read about Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary to China back at the beginning of the 1900s, early, early 1900s. If I understand the story correctly, Hudson Taylor grew up hearing his daddy pray for missionaries to be sent to China. He would very often pray this, and this young Hudson Taylor was there listening to his daddy's prayer. Does someone want to volunteer to say who was the person that answered daddy's prayer? Yes. Hudson Taylor answered daddy's prayer. He heard these words so many times where, where his daddy was interceding to God to send someone to China as a missionary so that lost souls could be saved. That daddy's prayer and his words into that little boy's ears formed his destiny. It's where he ended up. He spent, I think he spent 51 years there. And so it's the same way in our homes. What do you want your children to be? Where do you want them to go? Who do you want them to live for? Themselves or for God? I believe it's determined by how we pray and how we speak into their lives as they grow up. Another example that I read was a young boy who his, his mom and his dad had this, uh, they had the understanding of prophetic words. And so they would often pray over him or speak over him that, that God wants him to live his life in a righteous, godly way, making righteous choices throughout his life. And so they would speak that over him. And as he grew up, when he faced temptation, he remembered mom and dad's words. That he is to make righteous choices. And so he would. He'd say, oh yeah, I need to make, okay, I'll make the right choice in this situation. Or, okay, so this is temptation. I'll make the right choice instead of the wrong choice. Those words that they had spoken and prayed over him 
caused him to continue walking in righteousness all of his life. Now, of course, if that isn't then later submitted to the blood of Jesus Christ, they'll just go into a performance spirit where they could actually be living a secret sinful life and performing righteously outwardly. That's possible too. But there's still that reality of what it creates in a person's heart and soul. So now, bring it right down to each one of us personally. What do you believe about yourself personally? Do you believe that you are inadequate? You never get it right? You just don't reach around? Or what do you believe about yourself? If, if you believe negative words about yourself, you are hindering yourself drastically. Did you hear that? If you believe negative words about yourself, you think them, you believe them, and you speak them, you are hindering yourself drastically. So instead of believing the negative words about yourself that you're not good enough, you don't reach around, you never get it done right, or on and on, whatever you want to add to that list, I would recommend you find out what the Word of God says about you. And believe what the Word of God says about you. For ex- just, uh, there's literally hundreds of verses that we could use to back this up, but I'll just look at a few. Let's go to Matthew 5. So Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14, it says, You are the light of the world. Wait, 13 says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. If you are in Christ, if you've been forgiven of your sins and you're living for Jesus Christ, even though you don't get everything right, this is still who you are. You are salt and you are light. You ever have noodles or mashed potatoes without salt? They're pretty flat, right? You take some salt, you spritz it on there, it's like, wow, these things are good. That's how our lives are. As a Christian, if we have the label Christian on our lives... And, and we're not living, let's say you're living a double life. People around you know that you're a Christian, but you're acting like a crook, or you're, you're selfish, or you're, your jealousy comes forth, or, or you're an angry person. That is a Christian without salt, mashed potatoes without salt. And people that are experiencing you, just like you're experiencing the mashed potatoes, aren't really impressed. Ah, these potatoes are kind of that today. What's wrong with these things? Oh, so that's what you call Christian. I'm really not interested. Don't really feel like hanging out with you. But if you apply apply the salt of the Word of God to your life's journey, Christian, oh, really? What what can I learn? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. So this one is particular in the area of, again, what you believe about yourself. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all in every place upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both heirs, both theirs and ours. Called to be saints. In, in a, a little German booklet that we studied when we, when we took the instruction classes to join the church, In there, it said that when we have rightly repented, rightly believed, meaning repented in and through Jesus Christ and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, not done it perfectly in our our performance. That's not what it rightly is talking about. It's talking about rightly believing on the gospel of Jesus Christ, rightly repenting of our sins, not in a hypocritical way, but done it properly according to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. When that happens, you are a saint. And you are, the book there teaches us that you are incorporated into the fellowship of the saints. And so what we have here this morning is an assembly of the saints. So if you've been forgiven of your sins and you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and you don't feel like a saint, 
then either you've got some repenting to do, or you simply need to line up your thinking with the Word of God. Be not conformed, Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you line up your thinking with this, and you say that the Word of God says, and this is just one verse that I picked out about saints. The Word of God talks a lot about saints. And if you, want, if you don't feel like a saint this morning, or you don't think that you're a saint, then I encourage you to take the Word of God and study everything it says about the saints, and believe it. Believe it about yourself. Because what we believe, what we think, and what we say determines where we end up. It determines our destiny. It determines your children's destiny in a powerful and direct way.